Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It's a day you have made and we rejoice in it because we rejoice in you. And you are the Creator and you are the Redeemer. You are the Sanctifier. You are our God. You are our Lord. And we honor and bless you and worship you. Lord, we thank you for the message that we'll hear today from 1 Peter 4. I ask you, Lord, to anoint my tongue to declare this word you've given me today. And I pray, Lord, that all who hear it would receive it and understand it and uh, rejoice in it and live it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week... We heard from both Peter and Paul how we are to be dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Both of those, being dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, both of these are accomplished in us through the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in every believer. Willpower alone is not going to do it. It's not going to enable us to live for God or die to sin. We must have the Spirit of the living God living in us and doing this work in us. We've got to depend on Him. This week, we come to a topic that we've got to hear, but we don't like to hear. The topic is that of the sufferings Christians can go through on account of their allegiance to Christ, on account of our allegiance to Christ. We begin today uh, at... The 12th verse of 1 Peter 4, Peter writes, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Peter's words and the, and the way Peter writes them, they're interesting. We don't really recognize it in the English, but it's clear in the Greek. Peter's words of verse 12 are written in the imperative mood, which means these words are a command. Peter commands, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. The possibility of suffering for Christ is not something we usually want to think about, and yet we've got to think about it. Jesus made it very clear that suffering for his name's sake would be a very real possibility for everybody who follows him. For, well, for all who follow him, the possibility is there. Now, we know that every one of Jesus' disciples suffered for Christ's sake. They all didn't die for him, but they all suffered for him. Many of the first-generation believers, those who came to faith in Jesus Christ through the preaching of those Jesus' first disciples, many of them suffered for Christ's sake. In every generation since, believers in Jesus have suffered for Christ's sake. And vast numbers of believers in Jesus are suffering and dying today throughout the world. I think the last number I heard was something like 900,000 died last year for Christ Jesus. It isn't a strange thing to find ourselves facing suffering because we belong to Christ. Jesus came to usher into the world the kingdom of God. The world, as we know, became polluted with sin when Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, they handed over to the serpent the title deed of earth. Jesus came into the earth coming behind enemy lines, so to speak, to infiltrate the kingdom of darkness with God's kingdom of light and take back the title deed of earth. Now, he accomplished that through his death and resurrection. But this is also why we can expect suffering as believers in Jesus Christ. As believers in Jesus, as members of the kingdom of life, like we still live in the kingdom of darkness. We still, we are living behind enemy lines. Okay? Naturally, living as we do behind enemy lines, the, lines, the enemy will do whatever enemies in physical wars will often do when they capture members of the opposing side. They treat them as badly as possible, sometimes torturing them, sometimes killing them. Our enemy wants to destroy us. 
before we can bring more harm to his kingdom. He doesn't want us telling people about Jesus. He doesn't want Christian prayer in schools. He doesn't want the Ten Commandments posted publicly. He doesn't want anyone to hear that through Jesus Christ, a person can change their lifestyle. He doesn't want us helping the needy or the homeless or the unborn. He can't stand us because he can't stand Christ Jesus. And we stand with him, so that makes us his enemy. We need to get it out of our heads that suffering for Christ is a strange thing. It is not. Though we've been hearing how we are very likely to suffer for Christ's sake because we belong to him, there is more to the suffering which we undergo, which we've got to consider, which is this. The suffering we will endure is likely for our own good. Again, let's hear Peter's words. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you. Do we see that the fiery trial is to try us? The word translated here as try does not mean try us as in a trial, but to try us as in a test, the purpose of which is to refine us. You see, we understand that gold and silver are precious metals that can only be purified by fire. We are far more precious than gold or silver. But there are many impurities in us that do not belong within us as children of God. Now, we don't know what all of these are, but God knows exactly what they are. And God is the only one who can purify those things out of us through fiery trials. Now, none of this means that we are to line up and volunteer to go through fiery trials. No. <laughs> we don't have to line up and say, I'm in that fiery trial over there for this, and I'm in this fiery trial over here for this situation. No, we don't really know all the stuff that's in us that God wants to get out of us, and we don't know when it's God's timing to get it out of us. So, we got to let him do his work. You know, God knows the temperature of the heat, so to speak, that's needed to be applied to us and applied within us at any given time for any particular fiery trial. We've got to let God be God. For our part, we need to not be surprised when the fiery trials come our way. Now, there are numerous purposes in them that we cannot begin to imagine or fathom, so we've got to let God do his work. In verse 13, Peter tells us the attitude we are to have when we go through fiery trials. He states, but rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, rejoicing in the midst of fiery trials is generally not going to be our immediate first reaction. We're probably going to be more apt to moan and groan and cry out to God, Why me? But these aren't our sufferings per se. They are counted as Christ's sufferings because we're being allowed to participate in them. Now, how is that possible? How can we be suffering but it be Christ's sufferings? Well, it's possible because we are Christ's representatives in the world. The enemy strikes at us because he wants to strike Christ. So these are counted as Christ's continued sufferings because we are receiving them because of him. Now, our sufferings are in no way the same as when Jesus suffered on the cross for us. That was a suffering where he took all of our sin and all of our guilt and all of our shame upon himself on the cross and he suffered the judgment we were to receive. Okay? This is not the same. The sufferings we are suffering are solely because the devil hates God and Jesus and anyone who belongs to him. 
in the end, when Jesus returns to earth, when the devil is finally cast into the lake of fire, we are going to be rejoicing with great joy because we belong to Christ and his inheritance is our inheritance. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 18, he said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This actually is a rather amazing statement, considering how much Paul suffered on account of Christ. So how much did Paul suffer? Well, he spells it out in 2 Corinthians 11. And there we read, he says, he's asking the question, are they servants, meaning the others who claim to be servants of Jesus Christ? You know, he says, I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have spent in the deep, I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on, on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food in cold and exposure. Even in all of this, Paul could still write. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. No amount of suffering can compare to the joy we're going to have in the presence of our God and Lord and Savior throughout eternity. No amount of suffering can compare to that. Getting back to Peter, he writes... If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and, and of God rests on you. On their part he is blasphemed. But on your part he is glorified. Now we must understand that the sufferings we suffer for Christ glorifies him. Our choosing to suffer for Christ glorifies him. Those harming us, they of course mean it for evil. Okay? And so he says, you know, those that uh, on their part, those that reproach you and so forth, you know, on their part, Christ is being blasphemed. That's what they are doing to Christ and everything like that. But he says, but for your, what you're participating in is for Christ's glory. So those harming us mean everything that they do, they do to blaspheme Christ. Peter is, however, quick to add this verse. He says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Let's not be busybodies in other people's matters. Such behavior is unbecoming a believer in Christ Jesus. Such behavior brings this... That kind of re behavior brings reproach to Christ's name, who we represent. We need to flee from such behavior. Peter then admonishes uh, believers. He says, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Again, glorifying God in our suffering is not likely to be our first reaction to the suffering, but we need to eventually get to that point because when we suffer for Christ, we actually are glorifying God. Verse 17, he says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, this verse is very interesting. And there are, are plenty of explanations to it by various commentators. I did search a number of those, and unfortunately, this is one of those passages that no two commentators said the same thing. So, let's look at some of the words that Peter uses. He says, the first word we come to is the word translated as time. Okay? 
Now, probably you're going to want to focus really hard on this because this gets a little complicated. The word time can be either translated from the Greek word kairos or chronos. Okay? Kairos or chronos. Chronos is a specific time, like when we ask the question, what time is it? What time is it? Chronos. You know, what time is it? Clock. Chronos. What time is it? You know, we ask that, we want to know the hour and the minute. Okay? Kairos, on the other hand, though it is translated as time, it is better understood as an opportune moment or season for something God wants to have happen, God's purposes to take place. So one's a specific time, and the other one's like a season or an opportune moment. Let me give you an example from Acts chapter 3. Peter and John, they were going up together to the temple at the hour of prayer at the ninth hour. So this is in the afternoon about 3 o'clock. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. He was laid there to ask alms from those who entered the temple. This man, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Christ Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God. We're trying to understand Kairos here. This lame man was laid at the temple gate called Beautiful every single day. This means that every single time Jesus went up to the temple, he passed by this man. But he did not heal him. Jesus didn't heal the man because, one, Jesus was not the one God would have to heal this man, and two, it wasn't the man's time to be healed. The opportune time, the Kairos moment, was coming to this man after Jesus' ascension into heaven and after Jesus' disciples had been empowered with the Holy Spirit. When that Kairos moment did come, Peter knew it, and he seized upon it, and the man was healed. So having learned the difference between Kronos time and Kairos time, the Greek word used in 1 Peter 4.17 is the word kairos, not chronos, but kairos. Since the word used for time is kairos, we're actually talking about a season of judgment rather than a specific day of judgment. Okay? This means that an opportune time, an opportune season had arrived for the season of judgment to begin at the house of God. This particular season could not come until Jesus had finished his work of redemption. But since he finished that work nearly 2,000 years ago, the season of judgment has been in place and will remain in place until God ends it. How is the house of God judged? By the way the house of God lives for God and Jesus' his son in every generation. That's how the house of God is judged. We are that house of God. So how is the house of God judged? By the way the house of God lives for God and Jesus in every generation. Well, anyone want to venture a guess how our generation is doing? Well, I'm thinking that in every generation there's always been room for improvement. Let's remember that, you know, that God's judgment, it isn't a bad thing. It's meant to correct us and get us back on the narrow road which leads to life everlasting with God. 
Can God's judgments be harsh at times? Yes, they can. But sometimes we need them to be hard. All too often our focus is not on God. It's on the world and the distractions of the world. Let's remember that we are the ones that are supposed to be the salt and the light of the world. When we live for Christ and for the gospel, it's of great worth to the watching world who needs Christ. The world needs to hear what Jesus did for the entire world through the cross and through the grave. The judgment that's going to come upon the world for not knowing Jesus or believing in him is going to be much worse than any judgment the house of God, believers in Jesus, will ever face. Let's have compassion on those people and live for Christ so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Verse 18 is interesting. It's a quote from Proverbs 11.31. And it's from the Septuagint. Peter writes, or he includes now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? What does this mean? It doesn't sound all that good in the English. So what are we to make of it? I mean, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? You know, since Peter has been talking all along about the season of judgment and how it, had been, how it had now begun, he's likely pointing to how hard the righteous will have in this life with all of its struggles and temptations to sin and persecutions and judgments from God. There will be likely times when we're going to feel like we're barely holding on. We're barely holding on to this faith we profess to believe, although we shouldn't worry because God's holding on to us. Okay? Keep that in mind. That's most important. If we have it hard, how hard will it be for the ungodly and the sinner when the judgments and the wrath of God falls on them? You know, they're going to have a very, very, very hard time. Which is why we need to be the salt and the light in the world. They need Jesus. As hard as this life can be on believers... It's going to be awful for unbelievers when God's judgment comes to them. The last thing Peter writes is to encourage everybody who's going to be suffering. He writes, therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Suffering for the sake of Christ is not going to be easy for anyone and not everybody is going to be called to suffer. That's totally in God's hands. Who suffers? But if we do suffer, it's because God will have willed us to suffer. Since God will have willed us to suffer for Christ's sake and for his name's sake, we can commit our souls into his care, into his keeping, because he is our wonderful creator. He is more than able to prevent any harm from coming to them. Harm may come to our bodies, but we're going to be safe for all eternity because we have committed our souls to our faithful creator. This is good news indeed. Amen.